Good afternoon, and uh, can I say Merry Christmas? Christmas is just, few, just a few days away. If you could turn to your neighbors with a smile, maybe we could tell them Merry Christmas. Can we do that? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I think your 2020 was, uh, was an amazing year for me personally. I know we had all kinds of historic things happen this year, including pandemic and election and, 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 and more. But as I reflect upon uh, your 2020, this surely was an exceptional year. In my soul, I, I, I rejoice this. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And uh, I just want to praise God for his coming as a wonderful Savior. Can you imagine the world without him? That will be, yeah, that will be disastrous, isn't it? Can you imagine history without Christ? Can you imagine this country without Christ? It's just absolutely hopeless, right? So I, uh, I just want to praise God for his uh, wonderful coming into history. You know, it's interesting because we're going to talk about his coming and we're going to talk about his leaving, his birth and his death. We're going to talk about the cross, right? And... Arguably, which is not unclear in my heart, the most important day of history is the cross. Okay? And you may say, no, his birth is more important, his resurrection is, is more important, but he came to die. And without his death, there is no resurrection. So, you know what I mean. So, you know, during this week, we will have a service on this Friday on Christmas Day, uh, I want to talk about the cross. You know, they, we celebrate and we commemorate uh, his coming, and I want to talk about his coming and leaving, his uh, birth and death, right? So that's what I'm hoping to do. And those of you who uh, didn't get to join last time, we have started John chapter 17, which is known as the real Lord's Prayer. Real Lord's Prayer. What do you mean? Because the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught in the Gospels is really for the disciples. It's not really for, this is how you should pray, Jesus said. But John chapter 17 is, uh, to say the least, it's unique because there is no place like in the entire Bible where we hear the conversation or the communication or the prayer between the second person of triune God speaking, praying, communicating with the Father. There's no place like it. Now listen to me. What do you pray when you pray? You pray what's in your heart, right? So this is Jesus' heart, folks. You know, this is Jesus' heart. And he prayed... Today's topic, very provocative if you just take this out of context. But he prayed, Father, glorify me. Can you imagine? Hey, glorify me. Can you imagine that? But that's not what he's doing, obviously. But he is praying that, Father, glorify me. Like, a lot of different questions come to my mind. It should come to your mind as well. Why did he pray so constantly? And why did he pray to the end? Isn't that a great question? That's a great question, actually. And if you understand that, that explains why you should pray. You know, prayer is probably the hardest thing in pastoral ministry to mobilize people to. <laughs> Some of them say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. It is. It really is. You try it, okay? It's, it's much easier to mobilize people for parties, gatherings, eating together, 
I mean, you know, I'm not against that. I, I, I love that. It's much easier to make people to stay awake and praise than to pray. Do you agree? I know in, in your inside, you, you should be able to answer that. But Jesus constantly prayed, and he prayed to the end. Now, would you think with me? I want to give you a, uh, a framework. Jesus is a pre-existent God. Before his birth and incarnation, he was eternally in glory with the Father. Right? So after his incarnation, birth, until his resurrection and ascension, 33 years and 40 days, I'm not sure exactly, right? That 33 years, and after that, he's in, in infinitely, eternally, in glory with the Father. Isn't that kind of interesting? Right? And just for that 33 years, he prayed. Just think about it. I think that's a very uh, good thing to have it in your mind. What's, this, what's the place of this prayer? So he said, Father, he lift up his head, look to the heaven, just like the Jewish rabbi, and just pray, the hour has come. Glorify me. Right? Glorify me. It sounds awkward and a little self-absorbed or self-focused, uh, self, uh, but that's not what he's praying. Glorif the hour has come. Glorify me, which means glorify me through the cross. Glorify me through the cross. In other words, the cross is the glory of Christ. And we who understand the message of the cross, we glory in the cross. We glory in the cross. John 17 is a prayer of Jesus recorded in the scripture, and this is the only place. There are bits and pieces, but that's not really, you know what I mean? Nothing like John chapter 17. Entire 26 verses is the prayer recorded. That's grace, isn't it? Recorded in the scripture like no other chapters in the Bible with simple words, yet, and yet it is so profound. It is just amazing, right? So it's like you walking into holy of holies, if you will. Some people say where the son, the second person of Trinity, prays and communes and communicates to the Father God. So in the holy of holies, so it is the intra-Trinitarian communication. It's intra because it's one person, right? I mean, one God, three persons, but one God. So it's intra-Trinitarian communication or communion between the persons of triune God. It's amazing, amazing thing. What do they discuss? What do they talk? What's in the heart of, heart of Jesus? Again, nowhere in the uh, scripture, this kind of actual content is recorded to this extent. Jesus just completed his uh, upper room farewell discourse to the uh, fearful, beloved disciples. And he promised wonderful things, very, very important things, and we spent about four months studying about this. He promised, my peace I give unto you. That's the peace with God. Are you at peace with God? I need to ask this question. Are you at peace with God? Bible says you were born as an enemy of God, and you live as an enemy of God. You live actively in rebellion against God, and you die as an enemy of God, and you will stand before the omniscient almighty God one day as an enemy of God. That's the story of human being, but Jesus promised, my peace, I'm going to give unto you, okay? Secondly, he promised his joy. I'm not talking about, are you joyful during this Christmas season? That's not what, it, what he's talking about. My joy, that just kind of stems from your soul. Soul, right? What about my spirit? I think that's a huge one. Paracletos, we spend five weeks, many Bible studies. That's like a new chapter in history. Are you aware of that? The hour has come. You know, history 
belongs to the Lord. And he writes, do you care to know or you just live? He said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and he'll be with you and in you. Which takes a whole uh, sermon to explain that, but he actually tabernacle in us, in us, mano in us, okay? And uh, forever, you do not lose him. You do not lose your salvation. And he promises word, the scripture, through you, you know, with the work of Holy Spirit, I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to help you interpret, recall the right things so that it will be recorded. And through you, I'm going to write and give my word. And finally, you know what? You exist for it. What, what the purpose is. Just as Father has sent me, I'm sending you into this world. You know what you're living for. You don't live just for whatever, confused. You know exactly what you're looking for. These are all great promises. And at the end of the sermon, uh, of his discourse, he finished with a strong statement, strong note, forte, fortissimo note. Fortissimo, right? He said, in this world, you will have tri tribulations. Make no mistake about it, people. In this world, you will have tribulations, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's present perfect tense, errorist. Seminary students, right? In other words, it's done, but the effect of that event just continues. In other words, kind of interesting because he's going to the cross next day, but he's saying in past tense, I have overcome the world. It's done deal. What is going on? We kind of explained. I explained last, uh, last time. In Jewish idiom, idiom, the way of expressing what is in the future, if the person is so certain I mean, there is no question about it. He states the future in past tense. And, and Jesus said, I have overcome the world. There's a sense in which whatever God declares, it's done. Okay, for those of you who follow. <clears throat> so John chapter 17, I'm going to give you a little bit uh, more of, uh, of the background or the context. After that statement, I have overcome the world, and then Jesus goes into prayer. Do you see the dynamic? Do you see the place of prayer? Why? Because he knew the fact that in order to overcome the world, he need to go to the cross and overcome the world and fulfill all the promises that he promised. He needed Father's will and power. Did you know that? Remember, Jesus went to the prayer of Gethsemane, and this is what he prayed. Okay, listen to this. You're going to overcome the world, but Father, take this cup away from me. How do you reconcile the two? Father, take this cup away from me. Take this cross away from me. All things are possible with you. You're omnipotent. Take this cup away from me. He prayed, earnestly prayed. What do you hear? Does he sound like he's absolutely ready for the cross without the prayer? I don't think so. And then he prayed, not my will, but thy will. Let me just tell you something, brothers and sisters. In Jesus' humiliation as an incarnate son, which means he's fully human being, who being in very nature God did not consider equal with God, but he emptied himself and he became a man and he humbled himself. So he's a fully human being and he subject himself to the authority and the power of God. Without Father, he cannot carry it out. How much more for us, right? How much more for us? In John chapter 4, it's like a year ago we studied this chapter, uh, when Jesus was going through uh, the, what is that middle part of uh, Galilee? Samaria, yeah, Samaria. He was, as he was going through Samaria, she, uh, uh, he meets this woman, Samari uh, Samaritan woman. And after the encounter, uh, disciples came back from the town with food shopping, 
and basically said, Jesus, now you must be hungry. Take, take this and eat. Then Jesus says something very, very interesting. You have, I have food that you do not know about. Hmm. Okay, and he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish it. And I say this slowly because this is going to be important for John chapter 17. My food, in other words, my sustenance, my energy. How many of you like food? Would you say amen? I never heard such an enthusiastic amen in this congregation before. <laughs> okay. My food is to the will of him. It gives me energy and joy and my sustenance. And Jesus is saying, that's to do the will of him, to obey him. My obedience makes me come alive and joy, joyful. Can you believe that? And to accomplish it, to finish it. And we're going to talk about why the cross is the glorious thing. Because through that, he finishes his obedience, perfect obedience. Okay? So he begins his prayer with this, uh, this combination. The hour has come. Okay? Glorify your son. What hour is that? It is the hour that the son of God, son of man, is to take up the sin of humanity as a lamb of God. The most crucial hour of history, isn't it? Without it, you have no reason to sit here. Without it, you have no chance when you stand before God. Without it, yeah, without it, there's no, nothing, no Christianity. The hour that they have prepared and predetermined before the foundation of the world, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they had a council, and they planned it, they pre predetermined, and the, the hour has come. And son is saying, the time has come. Send me to the cross. That's what he's doing. The time has come. Send me to the cross. Okay? The hour that Jesus sacrificed himself as a ransom. I love that word, ransom. Okay. And the penalty, it is the hour of cleansing of your sin. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, God looks at you, and I'm, I'm going to explain this a little later, and he sees your heart white as snow, which is a real wonder because he's omniscient. And he sees you, he forgets about everything that you have offended in him and sin. I don't know how, what to make of that. It's the wonder of God's grace, isn't it? His omniscient, at the same time, I forget not. Your sin will be clean and white as snow. Right? Amazing thing. It is the hour of atonement when the Son of Man will draw all men to himself and bring salvation. Cross, through the cross, just like the serpent was lifted up uh, in the desert, Son of Man must be lifted up, John chapter 3. And when the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Can I just ask you? I think that's what the Lord is doing in 2020. And throughout history, people, it is through the cross. It's through the message of the cross. And that hour of glory has come. And to him, the cross was glorious, glorified. Okay, so finally we are, uh, we have caught up, and uh, so how is the cross bring glory to Jesus? Two weeks ago, I gave three reasons, and I explained just the first one. It's that important. That's how, why I'm taking so much time. First reason is, through the cross, Jesus gave you eternal life. Now, would you think with me? If it is through the cross... You have eternal life. What about other claims of other religions? That's a big question, isn't it? But Jesus said, it is through the cross. It is through, only through the cross, you will have eternal life. That's why cross is glorious. Okay? 
Secondly, today, it is through the cross Jesus accomplished his perfect obedience or perfect righteousness you're going to need. That's why it is important. And third, through the cross, Jesus returned to the Father or to the, back to the glory. It is through the cross. You know what? It applies to all of us. It is only through the cross you will be returned home. It is only through the cross. So let's begin. <clears throat> Today's text, we're repeating the first five verses. If we were to divide the chapter in three sections... Uh, verse 1 through 5, Jesus prays to God for himself. Not selfish reason. Lord, glorify me. The hour has come for me to go to the cross. So he prays for himself, for the glory of God, and for us. And from 6 through 19, Jesus prayed for the disciples or the apostles. And lastly, uh, verse 20 through 26, he prays for the church. And he prays for you. You know what Jesus is doing right now? Uh, could you, Jesus is praying for you. You know, I don't mean to taunt you, but who, who prays for you? Sometimes, you know, don't you wonder, who prays for you? Jesus is praying for you. And Jesus had been praying for you. Okay. So the first one, a little bit of a review, Jesus was glorified through the cross because he gave you eternal life to those God has given him, okay? God has given Jesus authority for all humanity. Your life is in his hand. Scripture says he has an op absolute sovereignty over your life. Did you know that? So it is to your advantage to know his greatness and his love and submit to him, isn't it? God has given absolute authority uh, of all humanity to Jesus so that through the cross, he may give you eternal life. Okay? Do you have eternal life? How many of you have eternal life? Would you say amen? It's interesting. Some of you may think, isn't eternal life yet to begin when I die? Not according to Jesus, not according to the Bible. That's why I could ask this question, whether you have it or not. Eternal life is not so much about your existence after your death. The Bible never commits to that kind of understanding of eternal life. In fact, the Bible does commit to this, though. Every one of you will exist eternally. Either eternally living or eternally in condemnation. Make no mistake about it. Bible makes it clear. Bible does say you will exist eternally. And it does not say eternal life is something you begin after you die, but it says eternal life. In fact, he defines the eternal life in verse 3. Can we take a look at verse 3? This is eternal life. Can you, can you believe that? He actually defines what eternal life is, and he said in his prayer, eternal life is this, that, that they know you, the only and true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let me ask you, when you look at what Jesus is praying from his heart, do you feel like there's many, many different ways to salvation and eternal life? Eternal life is to know you. So it's, not, it's about knowing a person, right? Only true God. There are two adjectives. Only God. It's not like there are many gods, but there is only one omnipotent God. We talked about this. Think with me. If there are three equal, powerful deities, and God is one of them, God that we believe is one of them, can you put your trust in him? What about his plan? Can he claim the sovereignty? That doesn't make any sense, right? He's not sovereign. They're equal in power. Deity number two, deity number three could easily hinder and frustrate and stop the plan of God, and therefore he's not sovereign at all. The Bible says, there is none like me. 
only God is omnipotent, right? And omniscient and omnipresent. And Jesus is saying that eternal life is to know him, right? Only true God. I think many people worship false gods. I really do because if you don't know him, how do you know whom you are worshiping? That, that, that makes sense. You know, on Friday nights, we are continuing our Attributes of God class, and I'm personally enjoying it. At this stage of my learning and studying, I'm really, really uh, enjoying it because every topic that we deal with, we uh, dealt with nine so far, and every topic that we dealt with, amazing topics like holiness, glory, sovereignty, providence, righteousness, wrath, love, every single topic is who Jesus is. Really is, people. And every single, this huge, gigantic topics I'm not talking about nine different people, nine different persons, nine different God. We're talking about one true God. Do you know him? Do you believe in him? Because eternal life is to know that only true God and Jesus whom he has sent. That's what eternal life is. So it doesn't say eternal life is something you kind of like have a ticket or assurance after you die, it doesn't say that, but it says that eternal life is person, quality of life, kind of life, which is now, right? It, it says Jesus is the true God and eternal life in First, first, uh, first John chapter 5, verse 20. Okay? Let me move on because I don't want to spend too much on, uh, on the review, which I already have. Uh, but I want to spend last two reasons which clearly explain the gospel. I don't know whether you clearly understand the gospel. I'm not underestimating your knowledge or anything. But like when we talk, when we converse, a lot of people don't have a clear grasp of that. Okay, so I want to explain that. So uh, let, let me skip this, okay? So we talked about eternal life. <clears throat> so I want to talk about second and third reason why the cross is glorious. Glory to Christ. Second reason Jesus was glorified through the cross is because he has accomplished, finished a perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. Okay? And where do we see that? Verse 4. I glorified you on earth and having accomplished. There, there is that word. John chapter 4 having accomplished the work that you have gave me to do. What is he saying? When Jesus came, every single step of the way, he was obedient to the Father. Why is that so important? It is very, very important. He proclaimed the word from the Father. He explained, he taught, and he lived, and he obeyed, and he worked. Everything is in obedience. If not, what happens? What do you call opposite of obedience? Disobedience. What is disobedience? Sin. If Jesus disobeyed, that means he sinned, which means he cannot be a substitute for you or a substitute for any, anyone. He needs to die for himself because the wage and penalty of sin is death. Do you understand that? That's why perfect obedience so important and for 33 years now think with me before his birth and incarnation there's no sin he's holy after his death and resurrection and ascension there is no sin he's holy god so we're talking about 33 years he came as a human being to die for you so he cannot afford to make one disobedience Perfect obedience, infinite obedience. And the last challenge was the cross. 
See, I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Again, he speaks in the future. Excuse me, past tense. What is in the future? Why? Because he's going to obey. Right? So his obedience is so important. And I want to explain what actually happened on the cross. Would you, would you wake up and listen to this? As, you are, as if you're listening for the first time in your life. Because you may or may not understand it. You ready? Okay. This is what happened on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, two things happened simultaneously. Stay with me. Your sin, your sin, all of it, past, present, and future until you breathed your last. Everything was placed upon him. So don't ask question what happened to the sins that I forget to, you know, confess later on or what happens if I have a dementia. Don't ask questions like that. Every sin, past, present, and future, it was placed upon him. So he, he's filthy, right? He's pretty filthy. Pastor Jun, pretty filthy right? because of you, because of me, Right? So every sin was placed upon him 2,000 years ago. Historically, he bore your sin. And by his death, he completely paid the price of your sin. Completely. Okay? So your sin has been paid. Now, can I ask you a question? Please answer. Who did the work? Jesus. Jesus died. But your sins are paid. At the same time, what about his perfect obedience? 33 years of perfect obedience that you did not live. Perfect obedience and glorifying God. That is going to be bore upon you. Who did that? Who lived that? Jesus did. Not you. But this is what's happening. Okay? What happened on the cross? Your sin was placed upon him, he took your sin, he bore your sin, and he died completely paid for. And obedience that you did not live, you are children of disobedience, but his obedience, perfect obedience, was placed upon you. So who did the work? Jesus. He did the dying, and he did the, he did the obeying. You didn't do anything. You just came to the cross. Can I ask you? When God sees that, what does he see? This is what he sees. When God sees that you are united with Christ on the cross, what God sees is this. You're on the cross, and you died for your sin. That's how God sees it. You died. Okay. Simultaneously, when God sees you, you live that perfect obedience. That's how God sees it. So if you put those together, what do you hear? On the cross, Jesus did everything, and you get all the benefits. Okay. Not very complicated, not very difficult, nothing to be confused about. So if you add anything to that, you lose. Because if you add anything to that, you're going to mess it up. All you do is just you put your trust in him and give all of your sin to him. And he died for your penalty. And all of his obedience, he lived you bore and you take on. And when God sees, you died on the cross with Christ. And you lived that perfect obedience. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I pray that this gospel will never cease to be amaze you. I really mean it. Gospel is not some, something that non-Christians need but gospel is something that Christians need every single day. 
Can you imagine if I live with the gospel? Do you think I'll stand here with a pride? You think I could do that? If I, I am mesmerized by his love and grace and his work, do you think I could be standing here and judging you? Man, you think I could do that? Gospel is not just for non-Christians, but gospel is for Christians, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, that's us, God, He made Him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Very straightforward. For so many years, oh, what does that mean? What the, what, what does that mean? But it's straightforward, isn't it? For our sake, for us, God's work. God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. You know why perfect obedience is so important? You know why cross so important? Because through the cross, he accomplished a perfect obedience or perfect righteousness. We talked about the topic of omniscience last Friday, and one of the things that we talked about is everything about God is infinite. Perfect and infinite. infinite. 18-something Baptist Convention confession. Okay, I forget. But everything about God is infinite. Safe to add, infinitely holy. Infinitely righteous. Infinitely merciful. And you could never go to God unless your righteousness is infinite. How are you going to do that? You going to help? You going to try to add? Please don't because you're going to ruin it. Only righteousness and only perfect obedience and right, uh, perfect infinite righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. Amen? My brothers and sisters, please don't forget this. And if this is not make you humbled, you need to go to the Lord. You need to go to the Lord. Okay? Third and final reason why the cross is glorious is because through the cross, Jesus went back to the Father and to the glory. Okay? What do we see there? Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Remember, I gave you the framework. Before Christmas, before the incarnation, infinitely, eternally, he was in glory with the Father. He was equal in nature. Everything. He's holy God. But he humbled himself, became a man. And he's fully God and fully man, but he humbled himself. Right? For next 33 years, he need to obey, subject to his authority and his father's leading. And he lived. Now he wants to go back to the glory that he enjoyed before the foundation of the world. So a couple of things, I think, comes to my mind. We sense that, Lord, now that his work is done, he wants to go home. Right? He wants to go home with the Father. We sense it is to be with the Father, with the glory that he had and he enjoyed. He longs for that. But there is the last thing that he needs to go through. That's the cross. Without the cross, there is, there is no glory. Without the cross, there is no glory, Christians. Right? Glory that he had before the world existed, which means he is the pre-incarnate God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Logos, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and Word was, word was God. So he's 
separate person, and he is pre-existent person, and self-existent person, and he is God. Now he wants to go back. But how is he going to do that? Through the glory of the cross. That's why cross is glorious. Right? Jesus prayed to God, Lord, glorify me now. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Because in his humiliation, he humbled himself and became a man. That's why he's praying. In other words, it is the Father, listen carefully, it is the Father who glorifies him with true glory in the cross and what follows. It's the Father who glorifies. Do you want the glory in your life? Meaningfulness in your life? It's the Father who truly glorifies with true glory. Isn't that the case, right? Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. It's the glory, people. Father who glorifies you. Do you want my recognition? Don't bother. I pray that you will live for the recognition and the glory of the Father. Right? Don't bother. Don't try to look a good person in front of me. I mean, you know, that's meaningless. But it is the Father who glorifies him with the true glory in the cross and what follows. Okay? What happens after the cross? He was resurrected by the glory of God, and he was ascended, and he was coronated as the King of kings and Lord of lords. God glorified Christ. Can I give you an illustration? I know this is a, just an illustration. Have you ever seen a, a kid in a supermarket or in a public place who just doesn't behave? I know you have seen someone like that. I mean, maybe, I don't know, you know? Have you ever seen son, a little kid crying, screaming at the top of his lung and basically sometimes even curse at his mother? Oh, like, you, you just don't know how to deal, you know, how to look at that, right? But here's a question. When you see a kid like that, what about the parents? Is he or she better? Usually... The mother or the father doing the same thing. You, you know, screams at him and curses at him. And he just walks away. Right? It's that kind of picture, isn't it? And here's what I'm trying to get at. When you look at a scene like that, do you feel like, wow, that's a bad kid? Or do you more look at the parents? It's usually the parents, isn't it? Wow, that. When Jesus obeys, obeyed, it glorifies the Father. When children behave and live with dignity and decency and, you know, and whatnot, naturally the parents get the praise and glory. Jesus obeyed to the end and it glorifies the Father. And Father glorify the Son. You could never separate the two. Never separate the two people. Okay? True glory that he had with the Father before the world began. We're going to see that word 18 times in his prayer, the world. People, Christians, pay attention to the world. What Jesus taught about the world, cosmos, this world will hate you because this world hates me. Don't try to be a friend because Book of James says to be a friend with the world is being an enemy of God. Okay, don't, don't be confused about that. That's in his prayer, okay? It was the cross. Let me summarize and I'm done. It was the, through the cross Jesus was glorified. He gave you eternal life. Only through the cross, people. I don't believe in all religion leading to the same thing. I think that's a lie. I don't care who says it. 
I think that's a lie. Don't listen to the lie. Listen to the truth. Right? It is through the cross Jesus glorified because through the cross he finished his perfect obedience and perfect righteousness you and I need. Absolutely need. And it is the cross through which he go back to the Father and to the glory. Okay, can I just finish with uh, Philippians chapter 2? This is what God did, Father did. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equal with God, but he, hum he humbled himself and he became a man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself even more to be obedient to the point of death. That's the cross, isn't it? Even on a cross. So what did God do? Verse 9 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him, or glorified him, giving the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven, on earth, under the earth. Wow, that's pretty comprehensive, right? And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Son was exalted, and the parents' father is exalted. That's the glory of the cross, people. Only through the cross, only through the cross, we will see the glory of God. Let's pray.